God has freed people throughout history. And Harriet Tubman says she could have freed more if we only knew we were slaves to Instagram, to social media. Why did you want to come to Kanye's Sunday service today? Um, I mean, as controversial as he is, he is a legendary artist and um, I wanted to see what it was about. Here and stay all the way to the end because I want to make an announcement toward the end about some future events that we're having that you'll excited to hear about. Well, our guest, just to get on with, is Dr. Rebecca McLaughlin, holds a PhD in Renaissance literature uh, from Cambridge uh, University, and uh, so honored that she's here tonight. A lot of fascinating things in that chapter for those that have read it. Um, here's one that's fascinating to me. You show where science has been used, and I knew a hint of this, but understood it more after reading the chapel. The chapter has been used to actually bring credibility to racism. And so that's not the common narrative. The common narrative is if there were no religion, we would love each other more. Uh, this is John Lennon's vision. What if there were no religions, no heaven, no hell? We would have perfect unity. Uh, but in reality, it's that a departure from religion has been used to promote racism. So historically, unpack that for us. Yes, yeah, so I, I want to say with, with science is that science is an incredibly powerful and useful tool. And every single person in this room uses that tool every day. And we should be really thankful for the good things that science has brought to us, like vaccines and iPhones. Vaccines are probably better than iPhones, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, there are so many people alive today who would not be alive if we didn't have the advances of modern science. We wouldn't be driving cars, for better or for worse. I wouldn't have flown here on an airplane. So many things we have to be thankful for from science. And so many ways we can actually delight if, if we are people who believe in God, that we can delight in his creation more by understanding more through science. But science can't give us moral rules right. or directions. It can help us to design a bomb, but it cannot tell us whether or not to use it. And so science has been used for good in the world, and it's also been used for evil. And one of the things that I think is, is happening at the moment as um, you know, our atheist intellectuals today tend to believe strongly in universal human rights and in the idea that we can all be reducible simply down to our biological parts. And those two beliefs don't hang together. And actually, if you, if you start just measuring humans according to their scientific uh, characteristics, you don't have any basis for saying that I am equally valuable to you or to this gentleman here or to that lady there. Suddenly, we're all, there's no basis for, for human value at all, and certainly not for saying that humans should be equally valued. And, and as you say, there have been times where that has been used as a, a mandate for um, justifying uh, racial prejudice and... Um, Essentially, science is, is one of those things that can be easily co-opted by people of different worldviews and, and used to kind of justify what yeah. they want to do. I think there's a basic fact about human beings that we have a really hard time changing our minds. Yeah. Particularly about things that we deeply believe. And particularly about things we deeply believe that we believe in community. And that can be true in a Christian community and it can also be true in, in a secular community that we tend to, you know, we think that we're very independent thinkers and actually a lot of the time we're not. So I think it's very much true what you're saying that we can have more um, emotionally and uh, sort of motives for our beliefs that aren't necessarily purely rational. I think that's absolutely the case. And I think that's true of, of all of us uh, yeah. in, in different ways. But I think I would want to say that, and I think of this often as I bring up my kids, Christians should be the most intellectually curious people in town. Like we shouldn't be, if we're Christians, we shouldn't be shying away from questions and really hard issues. We should be leaning into them. And, and if, if you're not a Christian here tonight and, and you've experienced Christian churches as places where 
no questions are really allowed, and if you you know just have faith and don't ask questions, I don't think that's what the Christian faith offers us. I think the Christian faith is the greatest intellectual movement in all of history, and I think the intellectual curiosity of Christians has led to many of the greatest academic yeah. breakthroughs, including actually the origins of modern science. Wow. Which do you mind if I riff on that for a second? Please. So this amazing guy called Hans Halverson. It's a very mild-mannered philosopher of science at Princeton. And he is probably one of the top four philosophers of science in the world. And he argues that not only is it the case that historically the first scientists invented the modern scientific method because they believed in God, but that even today science is better grounded by theism than atheism. The atheists don't actually have any philosophical reason for doing science at all. And the way that he reflects on the origins of science in the scientific revolution is really interesting to me because he says, we often think that uh, scientific explanations are somehow an alternative hypothesis to God. But actually the first scientists started doing science because they believed that God was rational. And so if there's a creator God who made the world and is the kind of God who gives consistent laws and has a consistent character as we see in the scriptures, then maybe he created the world according to these consistent laws that, that we as rational creatures made in his image could discern. But they also believe that God is free. And so God can make the universe any way he liked. And the only way to find out how God in fact made the universe was to go and look. Like, this is the philosophical foundation for the empirical method, like how we do science today. So science is not something that is like owned by atheism. It's actually something owned by Christianity originally. And even today, one of the top philosophers of science in the world says Christianity grounds it better than atheism does. Wow. Unbelievable. But, but true. But true, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's true. Believable, I should say. Yeah, yes. Exactly. Well, I think it's true on a micro level, too. The greatest evidence that there is no God is all the tremendous suffering in the world. So. Well, interestingly, so, so Dawkins does say what you just said there, i.e. one of the greatest reasons to not believe in God is all the suffering in the world. However, that specific quote where he's looking at the universe and saying the universe as we see it now through the lens of science has precisely the properties we should expect that there is a bottom, no design, no purpose, no good, no evil, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference, actually exposes the fundamental weakness in the worldview that he is offering to us. Because he is acknowledging there that if you strip away every other meaning than, than what science can measure, there is no such thing as good and evil. There is no such thing as purpose. There is just indifference. And in fact, if you listen to Dawkins and Sam Harris and, and many of the, the new atheist intellectuals, you will find they do not believe in human beings any more than they believe in God. So Sam Harris wrote a book a, a few years ago called Free Will in 2012. And he said in that book, um, the idea that we as conscious beings are deeply responsible for our mental lives and subsequent behaviors is simply impossible to map onto reality. Hmm. Right? There are all these ways in which actually a, a, an atheistic worldview that is, is simply depending on science is eroding the very essence of what it means to be a human being, let alone the basis for us saying that human beings are equally valuable um, or that there is any kind of moral problem with me um, you know, shooting anybody in this room. So atheists may look at Christianity and say, you believe in a loving God, how can you believe that when there's so much suffering in the world? I think the first thing we need to notice is that actually, within their worldview, suffering doesn't matter. Like, what are we? We're atoms and molecules. What, what is good and evil anyway? There's no, all of these categories just, just disintegrate. But I think the second thing we need to say is that when we look at the scriptures, our idea that if God loves us, he could not intend for us to suffer, crumbles on every single page. And that's hard for us, because I think we have this natural expectation that God wants me to be happy now. Like that's, that must be God's plan for my life. And if it isn't his plan for my life, if it isn't his plan for most people's lives, how can I believe in a God of love? Mm -hmm. But when we look at the Bible, we find that the person in human history whom God has loved the most is the person who suffered the most. So that's our first kind of puzzle with Christianity. We find suffering, we find that the excruciating death of an innocent man literally staked to the heart of the Christian faith. So the idea that Christianity is just for like shiny happy people is utterly at odds with what the Bible tells us. Mm. And you'll find, as you read the scriptures, that the, the Bible is written by and for suffering people. 
There's hardly a page of the scriptures. I mean, maybe the Song of Songs. There's hardly a page of the scriptures otherwise that is not by and for suffering. It seems like it would make sense, the logical emptiness and void there would be in atheism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I want to shake people or hug them. Probably more the latter. <laughs> I'm kind of a hugger. Um, I don't know. I mean, we're all, we're all innately foolish is yeah. the reality of it. And we have a really hard time acknowledging that we're wrong. Um, I think, in my experience, quite often when people come to faith in Jesus later in life, if they didn't grow up in a Christian family, it is through an experience of suffering. And so I always find that interesting. Um, at the same time, I mean, some of my best friends, including my closest friend who I uh, um, dedicated this book to, uh, is not a Christian, and she just... She just doesn't see it. She sees how, with the starting points that I have, how everything else holds together. And in many ways, she experiences the, the loss and the emptiness that comes with not believing in God. But she doesn't have the motivation to, to hop over. And, and I think that's you know, reality yeah. a lot of people live with. I mean, sometimes people say, I wish I had your faith. Yeah. And I'm like, well, you do. You just put it in different things. Yeah. And then Jesus comes onto the stage of human history and he says, I'm the bridegroom. And John the Baptist says, I'm so happy. I'm like the guy, I'm like the bridegroom's friend now that the bridegroom's come. And I'm like, what, what's all this bridegroom talk? Well, it's because Jesus is the bride, like literally is the bridegroom. And we see it, the picture in Ephesians 5 of what marriage is really about. And we see it in Revelation. Angels announcing that the wedding of the Lamb has come and Jesus is marriage to his church bringing heaven and earth back together. So I started to realize, oh, the vision of, of marriage in the Bible is actually about the gospel of Jesus' love for his, his people and about the, the kind of unity that Jesus has with those who trust. On the bus today, Kanye West apparently stepping away from the music that made him famous at a listening party at the Auditorium Theater over the weekend for his new album, Jesus is King, a Kanye West experience. Music promoter Andrew Barber tweeted that West revealed that he will not be making secular music anymore, just gospel music. You're on your transformation doesn't mean that I'm in the right, I'm in the same spot with you. So, okay, all right, so, all right, all right, cool. Kanye West storms out on Kim Kardashian after confronting her about her super sexy Met Gala look. I'm really freaking out. You can now say that you're not into me wearing a tight you dress. You are my wife and it affects me when pictures are too sexy. On Sunday night's episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, Kanye surprisingly admits to having an issue with people gawking at his gorgeous wife. Of course, it's like a formal underwear. It's hot. It's like it's hot for who, though? So, like, the night before the fact, you're going to come in here and say that you're not into a corset bag. I mean, we love each other's opinions. Well, maybe not in this case, as Kim was not okay with the 42-year-old rapper's concerns over her choice in wardrobe for fashion's biggest night. I just feel like I just went through this transition where from being a rapper, like looking at all these girls and looking at my wife, like, oh, my girl needs to be just like the other girl, showing her body off, showing this, showing that. And I didn't realize that that was affecting like my soul and my spirit as someone that's married and loved and the father of like now with about to be four kids. And in lighter news, Kanye West made a surprise appearance at Howard University's homecoming in Washington, D.C. Saturday morning. He performed a Sunday worship type show. He's been bringing these worship concerts to cities across the country as he prepares for the release of his documentary album called Jesus is King. One more thing before I get out of here. What about... When I say I'm giving my life to Christ, and then these Christians like, nah, ain't that what we want? <laughs> this 
The devil brought me to the lowest place in my life, the lowest year of my life. And I said this year, I wasn't going to go one Sunday without starting a church. And that's what we did. We started Sunday service and people came together and the choir got bigger and bigger and bigger and people started feeling what it is and about four months in I got delivered. People don't always go to church the first day delivered. People be in different spaces and places and they walk. And that's something I had to learn when I was delivered because I was one of them type of Christians. You doing it, you doing that, I'll see everything that's wrong. Just lay back. God has already won the victory. Jesus Christ has won the victory. That's why when I rap, I say he will free our people. God has freed people throughout history. And Harriet Tubman says she could have freed more if we only knew we were slaves. To Instagram. To social media. To, oh, I'm about to pull up with the drink going. This man disrespected me. Ah! <laughs> Harriet Tubman said she could free more if we only knew we were slaves.